Good afternoon. I'm going to provide you an overview of the LNC estimate, and then we'll go into the an overview of the fee report. Um, our um, estimate, we're not making any requests for fiscal year 13-14. Uh, for budget year, we are making a request of $1.9 million in three positions as a result of three budget proposals, which will be discussed later in the agenda. Um, in 2007, LNC was required by statute to provide an estimate that includes all workload and costs required for the program, including current year and budget year proposals. To prepare the estimate, LNC identifies all state and federally mandated surveyor activities. We determine the facility counts by facility type. We uh, determine the number of activities per facility type, such as licensing activities, certification activities, complaint investigations. Next, we determine standard average hours to complete each type of, of activity. LNC surveyors use timekeeping system to enter data about the hours they spend on each activity. LNC uses this time data to calculate standard average hours per activity by facility type. For the most recent estimate, LNC calculated standard average hours over a three-year period. Prior estimates use standard average hours based on a one-year data. LNC then uses the facility counts, the required activity count, and the standard average hours to calculate our workload and compute the number of positions requ required and the associated cost. The estimate also includes costs for all non-field activities, such as policy enforcement, operations management, professional certification, field office, and headquarters management. We have some concerns with our estimate. Last year's estimate overestimated staffing needs by approximately 70 positions due to a transposition error made in the calculations. This year's estimate suggests LNC field operations needs approximately 66 less staff than our current staffing levels. Based on our unmet workload and our identified need to complete investigations more timely, we know this calculation is not accurate, is not an accurate reflection of our staffing needs. Some of the actions to address these concerns are LNC believes the primary driver of the error in our estimating methodology is the inaccuracy of our timekeeping system, which forms the basis for our workload estimates. We are developing a scope of work for an in-depth co contractor review of our timekeeping system and anticipate seeking bids for this project by the end of the fiscal year. In advance of the in-depth assessment, we have also formed an internal work group to immediately address ways to improve staff reporting into the timekeeping system. While we undertake these activities to improve our estimate, we recommend that our staffing levels and expenditure authority for fiscal year 14-15 remain at the fiscal year 13-14 levels. Moving on to the development of the fee report, statute requires that LNC publish a list of estimated fees in a fee report by February 1st of each year. Based on statutory requirements, LNC begins by projecting the mandated workload by facility type, allocating the LNC program, spe program special fund appropriation authority against each facility type's workload percentage, applying the regulated, the regulated credit and dividing the amount by the associated facility type's count of licensed facilities or licensed, bed, licensed beds. Regulated credits are defined by law as 95% of the amounts actually received for new licensure applications, including change of ownership applications and late payment penalties. In fiscal year 12-13, this regulated credit amount, after, uh, the 95% equals $3.8 million. These initial calculations result in some facility types with significant fee increases and other facility types with significant fee decreases. To avoid the large fluctuations that would result from our initial calculation, LNC applies additional credits from our LNC Special Fund Reserve. For fiscal year 14-15, LNC applied $11.6 million in credits from the LNC Special Fund Reserve so that facilities for which um, the initial fee calculation would have produced a fee increase, we have maintained fees at the fiscal year 13-14 levels. Um, for uh, provider types, um, we have three provider types, home health agencies, hospice, and referral agencies. Um, their, decree, uh, their fees would uh, decrease by 20% from fiscal year 13-14 levels. Applying credits from the LNC Special Fund Reserve also helps gradually reduce the fund reserve to 5%. 
The facility fee chart is found on page 8 of the fee report. The um, LMC uh, fee report also has the nursing home administrator program fees. Statute requires LNC to adjust NHAP fees based on program costs. For fiscal year 1415, LNC estimated the total program costs at 613,000 based on projected expenditures adjusted for changes in staffing levels. LNC applied a credit of $229,672 from program reserves to keep fees at an 8% increase. This approach will align the fee revenues to program costs in approximately seven years. Thank you. Okay. Any other comments from the LAO or finance? Mm -hmm. We note that the LNC's comprehensive program evaluation is not expected to be completed for over two years. So with respect to the estimate, we recommend that the department be asked to continue to identify and implement short-term solutions to address the methodology issues. Uh, okay. Public comments? Beth Capel on behalf of the doctors and nurses of AFSME who work in public and private hospitals across the state. Your agenda speaks to CMS having serious problems with what LNC does. It speaks to the backlog. It seriously underestimates how bad the problems are because it does not take into account that the workload fails to account for LNC implementing existing law. Very specifically, existing law enacted in 2006 requires LNC to monitor for compliance with state law. You wouldn't think you'd have to pass a law to do that, but we did. And very specifically with respect to the nurse ratios and the other staffing requirements in state law. LNC currently enforces if there's a complaint or if in the process of a survey they inadvertently stumble over a staffing shortfall. They, however, do not monitor for compliance with state law despite the requirement in state law that they do it. The workload proposals that you have before you that have been described by the department do not anticipate or plan for this additional workload, which they should. Thank you. Mario Guerrero with SEIU Local 1000, and I'll just keep it brief. I think that if, as you look at your formula, if we can uh, make sure that our workers are involved in those conversations so that we do get a good formula that represents the workload, because we know that um, the state has experienced many cuts, and it's hard to see how we have a backlog yet, but yet we're, you know, considering in the future possibly um, minimizing or shortening the, the workforce. So we look forward to working with you. Michelle Cabrera with SEIU State Council. We represent both the state workers as well as um, local 721's um, licensing and certification nurses and field staff. And um, just to add on to the comments of Mr. Guerrero, um, uh, you know, the context here is in bad budget years, we uh, had hiring freezes, we had furloughs, all of this impacted the base on which a lot of these formulas and calculations are, are then built. Um, we also want to make sure that both LA County staff and state workers are included in uh, assessments of how to readjust workflow and um, also uh, would like to, um, you know, add on to Ms. Capel's comments about um, enforcement of state laws, we do know that from the worker perspective, they feel very understaffed right now in being able to meet these requirements. And, um, you know, given the importance on um, patient safety, we think that these matters should be addressed immediately. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Jennifer Gabalas with CASA, the California Association for Health Services at Home. We represent home health hospice and home care providers, and we uh, appreciate the licensing fee schedule that includes a decrease for our provider types. It's much needed, and uh, we appreciate the department's workload on our life regarding our licensing fee and other issues over the last few years. Thank you. Okay. Any other comments? Questions? Yes. Thank. Just a quick comment. I. It, it, it's just hard to uh, reconcile how, uh, <laughs> given the backlog that's been described, we could we could possibly do uh, an acceptable uh, job with fewer staff than we have now. And uh, I don't think there's a person in this room who doesn't want to see another headline that has to do with some tragedy uh, that's occurred that uh, can be traced back to. Uh, 
uh, inadequacy of licensing, review, certification, uh, the, the, because those aren't just headlines, those are, those are people who pay the price, uh, and they, they shouldn't. So uh, I'm going to look forward to what happens to this over the course of the, of the next months, but something that, something that comes back to, and says we can do a better job with fewer people is going to strain credulity from my point of view. Okay. I think that uh, probably sums it up. We've given you a number of staff uh, recommendations and questions, so hopefully we'll get some of those answered. Uh, for most of it, it's really, it is about um, making sure that we're doing the kind of job that we need to do uh, so we don't have the headlines that we've had in the past. And so maybe explain to us how uh, less we get it done. Maybe we have a lot of, obviously, uh, uh, excess somewhere in terms of our structure. Uh, but uh, surely it's something we want to make sure that we're aware of. Uh, as we address this particular issue, I know there are a number of bills on the floor that may have something to do with uh, services and those kinds of things. So we want to make sure that we have enough staff and, and budget to basically accommodate that. Okay. Any other comments, questions? Thank you very much. Let's move now to item number five, which is also the evaluation project with BCP. I. Uh, before we move to the BCP, I'd like to be, if it's convenient for you, to give you an overview of what we're doing with respect to the evaluation and uh, the timing for that evaluation of the LNC program, as well as some of the short-term activities that are taking place. I think that, that clearly there's a great deal of interest in this. Um, I think that what you heard from Ms. Gutierrez is the fact that we, we have a very seriously flawed uh, timekeeping system. The timekeeping system which uh, captures the, a variety of workload that is assigned to a nurse surveyor. So a nurse surveyor would, could potentially be doing a state complaint or a federal recertification survey or the licensing of a new service in a hospital or any other type of facility. And they are required to keep track of their time because we have, again, state funds and federal funds. So it's really important that the timekeeping system be accurate and capture everything correctly. We have uh, serious concerns about that because that the, um, as you can hear from the, heard from the description, the timekeeping and the average standard hours are the drivers of the fee report as well as the, the estimate and, and the basis for um, calculations of our, of our staffing needs. So um, we are um, tackling this issue both in the short term and the long term. We have a program evaluation, which I'll describe in a few moments, that, that is taking place. But uh, clearly, this timekeeping system has jumped out at us, as well as a few other activities. And so we're addressing them prior to the program evaluation being completed. Um, in the short term, with respect to the timekeeping, uh, we are assessing whether or not we have a problem with the timekeeping system, the way information is captured, or we have a problem with the way the information is consistently entered into the system. So we are launching um, an, an effort beginning uh, the beginning of this fiscal year to basically um, provide greater direction to the nurse surveyors regarding the entry of information will re we'll require more frequent entry than is currently uh, in, in practice within the licensing and, and certification program. And we will be, we'll be training, monitoring, and holding the supervisors in the district offices accountable for ensuring that the timekeeping is being done in, in the manner that it should. We believe that's important, and I think one of the key pieces was we don't always um, know whether or not new nurse surveyors are well aware of the impact that the capturing of this information correctly has on the number of nurse surveyors that are available to do the work. So I think that there's a, there's an opportunity to to remedy some of this in the short term as we as we launch our efforts to uh, basically review the entire system. So beginning in August of uh, 2013, a program evaluation was started uh, by a consultant. That, that evaluation consists of an assessment, 
a gap analysis, and a remediation plan. So it's basically an assessment of the program in its totality, looking at the licensing work as well under the state mandates, as well as looking at the federal work and determining uh, how that is moving forward. So um, that project will be completed by the end of, of June, and then we'll be launching into future efforts, which will be described in the BCP. But I would like to go ahead and just describe to you a few of the actions we are taking. I think it's obvious, it's, um, it's very obvious that we have a lot to do for this program. We have formed a management team working with the staff and licensing and certification to basically help move this forward over the next year. But we are developing uh, performance metrics and dashboards to help us better manage our complaint workload. We receive approximately um, nine, 6,000. 6,000 complaints in long-term care, for example, per year, and over 20,000 in entity-reported events that come from those long-term care facilities. So we need to be able to measure the performance of all of the staff. We have over 1,200 staff in the licensing and certification program. We are updating all of our databases so that we can better report the status of our uh, completed surveys and our investigations. We've, as I mentioned, accelerated the work in developing and working on our timekeeping system. Um, we have, again, by July 1st, we'll have completed the retraining and slight modifications of the timekeeping system so that we can capture information much better. We have completed some workflow analysis of different processes so far, and we believe that there's going to be many more to follow, and we'll be tracking different parts of our system. So. We are launching into this work, but I think that it is going to take quite some time to basically uh, complete the full assessments and then go ahead and tackle the work. But we're not waiting for any reports to come out or any other activities. We're, we're embarking on those that um, are apparent to us and taking action. Okay, anyone, anyone from the financial side with comments? Okay, anyone up here? Any public comments? Michelle Cabrera again with SEIU. Um, we obviously support uh, an, another look at this and a reevaluation. Would that it could be as simple as just revising our time, timekeeping? Uh, we're just hopeful uh, for two things. One, that we take the expanded view and look at whether uh, current state and federal laws are all being complied with and met. Um, and then also that staff are included not just as the subjects of this survey, but also as subject matter experts. Thank you. Okay. Any other comments? Okay, thank you very much. This item two is being held over, and um, uh, we'll now move on to item number six. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Scott Vivona with the Department of Public Health. Um, HQ04 BCP is a proposal that seeks one-time expenditures of $201,000 from the Internal Department of Quality Improvement Account to contract with UC Davis to assess the sufficiency of using federal certification standards as a basis for state licensing standards for the chronic dialysis clinics, rehabilitation clinics, and surgical clinics. The goal of this um, proposal is to determine if federal certification standards um, may serve as a credible um, basis for our licensing standards. Um, SP 543 uh, required um, the department to do a public hearing as well as a report to the legislature following the assessment that will be conducted. Uh, that report will be delivered to the legislature by July 1, uh, 2017. Okay. Any other comments? Anyone from finance? This is okay. Uh, anyone up here? Any comments? This is a result of SB 534. Okay. Not then. Uh, we would vote on this matter, but our quorum is out the room, so we'll wait till he comes back. He'll be back shortly. Let's move on to item number seven. Uh, this proposal seeks uh, uh, position authority of three positions and funding authority for 251000 in the California Department of Public Health Licensing and Special Licensing Certification Special Fund with a commiserate reduction in the California Health and Human Services Agency's authority to consolidate with NCDPH the enforcement of medical privacy statutes. 
The goal of this uh, BCP is to streamline and improve the protection of, of patients, medical information, by combining the uh, enforcement actions by CDPH and Cal OHI into one program. Uh, in 2008, legislation was enacted to provide CDPH the authority to investigate breach, uh, medical breach information against facilities, as well as the Cal OHI to investigate breach uh, information or breach reports against individuals. This proposal will have some efficiencies in, in the sense that we will be able to streamline, cross train, and conduct uh, simultaneous investigations. Sounds good. Okay. Anyone else? Any other comments? Anyone up here? Okay. Any public comments on this matter? Okay, it too will be held over till we get our quorum. Okay, it's up for a vote today. Item number um, eight. Good afternoon. Um, I'm here on the infant botulism program. Uh, the Baby Big is the department's public service orphan drug for the treatment of infant botulism. This drug is distributed nationally to all patients with infant botulism. The FDA approved the use of Baby Big and licensed it to CDPH in 2003. The program was established as a fee-supported program and hospitals which treat patients or insurance companies of the patients receiving the treatment pay a per-use fee. CDPH deposits the fees into the special fund to be used for the sole purpose of producing and distributing Baby Big. The production of the treatment is separated into lots, and the program is currently dispensing from lot five and developing lot six. Uh, Friday evening, this report was informally released to the legislature, and I understand that it was released um, today formally. So you should be getting that. And that was one of the questions that we had pending. Uh, two proposals related to this program are currently before the legislature. We have a BCP to address our spending authority issue. And this provides the legislature and stakeholders an opportunity to hear about this very important public health program. Um, with increased expenditure authority, the program is requesting an increase in expenditure authority from $6 million to $9 million in fiscal year 14-15 and $951,000 in 15-16. The current fund balance is $9.9 .9 million. The usage has unexpectedly increased in the last three years. It was an all-time high block last year of about 140, of, of 141 doses, and we're anticipating about 138 doses administered this year. The five to six year production cycle is what drives this cyclical expenditure pattern, which is dependent upon the phase in the production of the lot. The majority of the lot, uh, the majority of the expenses are going to be, for lot six, will be um, in the upcoming budget year in 14-15. Additionally, the costs have increased in the production, which have been um, related to expected inflationary factors, as well as three elements which require FDA approvals. Part of the department's challenge isn't just budgeting the right amount each, each year, but ensuring we have enough revenue to cover the cost, enough money in our special fund. With a continuous appropriation, the department would theoretically spend more money than generated in revenue, or could theoretically spend more money than, than generated in revenue. That's much harder to do with an annual budget with a fixed expenditure amount, which requires meticulous ongoing fiscal review. With that said, the department may revisit this in the future for um, asking for a continuous appropriation, but for now we believe the BCP will cover the current needs of the program for both 14, 15, and 15, 16. And the fee was originally established by regulation in 1996 at $22,900. But under federal law, the fee could not be charged and collected until the medicine was licensed by FDA, which did not occur until October of 2003. At the time of licensure, CDPH realized the original fee level was not adequate to meet the continually rising costs to produce Baby Big and distribute it. And that, that um, those costs were tracked very closely since 1996. 
So the fee was increased in 2004 to the current rate of 45300 based upon the known and anticipated baby big and programmatic operating costs at that time. The fee has not changed since that time, but it has been sufficient to meet the program operating costs in part due to the all-time record utilization of Baby Big over the past two and a half years, which has brought in additional revenue. Okay, thank you. Any comments? Any comments here? No? Okay, any public comments? Yes. Madam Chair, members, my name is Richard Neal. I am a parent in the group of interested parents who sought and helped obtain the passage of this statute in 1995. I lost a son in 1988 to SIDS, which is related to this. And our group became concerned uh, a year or so ago when it was announced that the department was going to do a zero-based budget analysis of the program. We pondered why a program which doesn't use taxpayer monies, relies on fees, is very small, and has worked very well, would need a ground-up uh, budget analysis. But we have waited patiently for the fruits of that analysis until Friday, when the report, which was promised for October 2013, finally issued. Uh, meanwhile, we had floated the idea of continuous appropriation. We heard back from folks in your staff that there were concerns about legislative oversight, and indeed we share those concerns, uh, particularly looking at the the, the report which has come out, which emphasizes only the production of the medicine and distribution of it and pays no attention to the other important statutory goals of research and prevention of infant, infant botulism. I heard this theme just a moment ago reiterated with the idea that the sole purpose of the fee fund is to produce the medicine. It's not true. The ultimate objective of this program is to find a way to prevent infant botulism. The medicine is wonderful. It's worked very well. Uh, in light of all this, I think, and I, my understanding from your staff is that in order to have any oversight measures, uh, that's outside the purview of this budget function, and, and therefore that uh, if we were to expect to have some oversight with a continuous appropriation, we need to re regroup and think about a different way to try to accomplish that. So I think that is where we are. We're going to accept the advice from your staff, and uh, but hopefully we'll be back. Thank you very much and for your attention. thank you for your work all these years. Appreciate thank it. You. Okay. Um, we will take a vote, but unfortunately we don't have our quorum back. So we're going to go on to item number nine. Good evening, Madam Chair and uh, Assemblymember Dickinson. My name is Jamal Miller. I am the Office of Health Equity Deputy Director, and I am here on behalf of California Department of Public Health's request to staff four positions permanently uh, for the Health and All Policies Task Force. Um, historically, the Health and All Policies Task Force stems from the Strategic Growth Council, which was established during the Schwarzenegger administration. And the priority of the Health and All Policies Task Force is to achieve health equity by um, embedding deeply into government a health equity and a health lens across, from a cross-sectoral perspective across departments, agencies, and offices within government. Uh, that coincides with an approach to achieving health equity by addressing upstream institutional inequities that are often rooted in non-health, non-medical fields. Uh, there are over 19 members of the Health and All Policies Task Force. It gives our office a great opportunity to achieve health equity by working closely with the task force members to embed uh, this health equity and health lens into all policies and decisions that are created. Um, I believe that permanently staffing these positions within the Office of Health Equity is a critical step. Historically, uh, the staff has been funded. Uh, through private funding with, uh, via the California Endowment that has funded via a grant um, contract through the Public Health Institute. And uh, with our ability to demonstrate the successes and continue to accelerate the successes that we've experienced over the last three to four years, um, this permanent um, opportunity for us to hardwire these roles into the Office of Health Equity once again 
creates a great opportunity for us to eliminate disparities and inequities in the state of California by accelerating a very strategic approach, approach that's cross-sectoral. And lastly, built into the statute that creates the Office of Health Equity requires that our advisory committee and our Office of Health Equity staff work closely with our Health and All Policies Task Force and staff. Um, and I'll, I'll end there in conclusion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any comments? From finance, any public comments? Comments from here, staff? Okay, it looks good. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have uh, four items that we need to vote on. Going back to item number six, uh, issue number six, uh, the implementation of SB 534. Is there a motion? So okay, is there a second? Second. Okay, can roll call? Weber? Aye. Chesbro? Aye. Dickinson? Aye. Grove? Mansour? Okay, item number seven, that passes, 3-0. Item uh, number seven, we have, and that is the uh, transfer three positions. Uh, it, can I get a motion? A second. Okay. Well, Weber? Aye. Chesbro? Aye. Dickinson? Aye. Okay. Grove? Mansour? All right. That, that's out on three votes. Issue number eight, which is to uh, the BCP, which is the Botulism Program. Uh, the expenditures for 2014-2015. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Okay. Cool. Oh. Clarify, it's both BCPs. There's two. Beg pardon? It's two BCPs in one It's two BCPs in one action. Yes, it is. Okay. Mm -hmm. Both of them, yes. Uh, okay. okay. Weber? Aye. Chesbro? Aye. Dickinson? Aye. Grove? Mansour? And the last issue, number nine. It's a motion to approve. Roll call. Weber? Aye. Chesbro? Aye. Dickinson? Aye. Grove? Mansour? Okay, so we took action on all of the items that we were supposed to take action on except for somebody wants to add on here. the one for public health. And he can add on, okay? Other than that, we are adjourned. So he can, we have someone to add on. We'll hold the roll open to allow him to add on. Huh? Okay, well, we'll I'll stay while he adds on, okay? And then I'll adjourn. Okay? We'll give him a minute to add on.